Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldkamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Welcome to Radio Naturopath. This is a call and talk show about health and natural medicine. It's February 20th, 2019. I am Fran Storch, ND, naturopathic physician. I'm here with my co-host, Ron Meniza. Good if morning, you, Dr. Fran. Hi. If you'd like to participate in the conversation about natural medicine, you can call us uh, before we have our guest on at 860-486-9487. That's 860-486-9487. You can also email me at radionaturopath at gmail.com. If you'd like to listen to this show at another time, you can check out our podcast at whus.org. You can also check out my Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram at FranStorchND. So while we're waiting for our guest to call, let's um, let's just give you some advice. So I've been I've been having a good time because for the last couple of weeks I've, I I got the bronchitis. So if anybody wants to know what that's like when Fran gets bronchitis, uh, I want you to, if if you're old enough to think back to, or if you actually have Netflix or something like that, and you can you can get this movie. This movie called The Exorcist, and uh, Linda Blair was in it. Oh, that's and, ridiculous! And and the uh, when she would be taken over by the whatever the it was, spirit. the spirit that was taking her over. Um, there was this horrible sound that used to come out of her. That's what Fran sounds like with oh, bronchitis. You're, you're funny. Yeah. You're really funny. Hey, hey, I thought hey. you were going to talk about Flipper. No, Flipper. No. Yeah, Flipper. He was barking. You corpus. mean? Oh well, yeah, but no, that was a, that was a happy sound. <sighs> Flipper had a happy sound. Your sound was a little more on the on the side of evil. Unfortunately, there's some, there's some misery going Ooh, on. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. 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 Well, and and I'll tell you, you know, it's okay if you want to get sick. You can get sick. People get sick. It happens. But the doctor should never get sick because it's way worse. I see. How the doctor that? does get sick. <laughs> um, saved by the bell. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce my very special guest, Dr. Clara Glowcamp, N.D., naturopathic physician. He's currently in Bern, North Carolina. Carl's a naturopathic doctor, acupuncturist, and he's certified in Chinese herbal medicine and environmental medicine. He was the first graduation speaker at Bastyr University to graduate with two degrees, Doctor of Naturopathy and MS in Acupuncture. He's got 16 years of clinical experience as a naturopathic doctor working with diet and lifestyle changes. Some of the conditions he's treated directly or supportively include cancer, gastrointestinal disorders, autoimmune conditions, endocrine disease, autism, gynecological disorders, diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and infertility. He also treated people with environmental exposures and designed detoxification programs targeting specific toxins and tested for genetic variants to more specifically support detoxification pathways with targeted nutrition. If you want to get more information about Dr. Carl, and you can, you can read all about him at his website, ketonaturopath.com. All right, so I'm going to put Carl on, and do we have contact? Yes, we do. How are you doing? Yay, it's so good to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, likewise. How's the weather in North Carolina? Well, we're pretty much semi-coastal, New Bern. Um, so right now it's gray and rainy, but the, I think we're in the 60s right now. Yeah, you're in the 60s. Lucky yeah. you. Well, lucky you. I don't we think we're going to see, yeah, I don't think we're going to see 30 today. We're, we're not. I grew up in New 
I grew up in New England, so I know all about it. Yeah. 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 I know. We're we're not actually in the 16s, but we're not in the 60s either. We But we were in the last yeah. day or two. I think we're in the 26s right Good now. times. Mm. Yeah, I know. I, I either learn to like it or move. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> oh. well, smart I, I think man. it was a smart thing. I know. Yeah, yeah, very good, yeah, to be down there. Okay, so we have all kinds of great things that we want to talk to you about. Because, you know, so Carl and I worked together for a short time in, I don't know if it was, it started in 99. It was definitely in 2000. We were at the same naturopathic practice, and then I left, and he eventually left. And you um, started a practice in Old Lyme which went on for a while. So I got to know you at that time, and, and um, you know, we had a nice uh, yeah, yeah. collegial relationship. And then, you know, over the years, I was just reading up on the ketogenic diet not too long ago, and I was, I was literally Googling ketogenic diet, and your name came up, and it took me to your website, and, it, and so I read the, your story is written on your website, and it's fascinating. So um, I, it, it made me really want to reach out to you and talk to you about it and see if you would want to talk about it on Radio Naturopath. So, sure. um, so your, your story, it's, it's like a, a health rags to riches. So I, I don't want to um, interject too much. I would love you, for you to tell your story. What led to your interest in the ketogenic diet, first of all? Primarily out of uh, wanting to save my life. Uh, it seems dramatic to say that. It seems a bit uh, uh, kitchen away, but uh, no, I, I was I was down in a very bad, bad place um, for a number of reasons. Uh, mother had died. My brother had just passed after nine and a half. My only brother had passed after nine and a half years of multiple myeloma. So my only good friend in the family. My wife had uh, an angioma, oh. and um, she had just come through thirteen hours of surgery, and so we're dealing with that. And um, to go back to the practice in Old Lyme, we had that for for the better part of a decade. And we we did so well where we were initially located that we felt that we could then buy a whole entire medical building and rehab it and have, you know, other people rent out a number of other rooms and a whole different floor. That's how big it was. So we sunk in all our savings for the most part. So 2008 came and went, and it just, like, sucked the air out of our practice. And uh, in the course of oh, maybe three years, it took us to finally declare bankruptcy. So all mm-hmm. those points that I just named came together really within a year, if not a six month coincidence. So, so wait, okay. before you go on, I just wanna, I just wanna say, that's an incredible story. My heart really, really goes out to you. I mean. Listen to what this this man just said. Just one of those items would have been would have been hard. Huge. Enough. Yeah. So you lost your. I mean, I'm like choking up. You you lost your mother, and and yeah. I've lost my father, and so I know what it's like to lose a parent. It's it's um if you have a good relationship with your parent, well whether you do or you don't, it's yeah. I I you know you don't get over that, and then no. your brother who you really loved, and you also wrote that you were caring for him. You were trying to help with his care. Oh, yeah. With his multiple right. myeloma. So you were you were really invested in helping your your brother who you loved dearly and he was your best friend and he passed and then Ju- Judy right yeah uh, yeah and then Ju- Judy got a brain I this is this is immense I just want to send you some love for having to go through something like that love is always open but that was that was then and it's hard to I mean I can't retell that part of the story without a a quivering lip but that was then. And, and once we were both sort of, oh, the, the crowning thing was, all that stress <laughs> does manifest itself in you whether you realize it or not. It's not like getting a massage. And so, consequently, my gut stopped working completely. I mean, no trips to the bathroom other than to urinate. And um, so when I finally got in to get a colonoscopy in New London, and um, that doc will remain nameless, but um, it was it was the worst uh, episode case of combined Crohn's and ulcerated colitis that they had ever seen. Oh my at goodness! At L and M. So now I have that, and so what do they do when they see that? They put you on a lot of steroids. Well, let's think that through medically. That if you have a high stress, in other words, this was induced by high cortisol, which is it can make you diabetic over a long period of time. It's yes. Blood sugar, mm. and so now you have. Who knows when the stress started, but let's say for a, certainly a couple of years, and you can probably say three years, but certainly that previous year, all those things happening. 
So now you're giving somebody more steroids. You're giving them more stress hormones. It's really right. not the way to treat a gut inflammation. I, I, by the way, I have no history of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. They came out of the blue and just blew up my, my gut. Right. So the problem then was I was just picking the hourglass was turned over. I had a limited amount of time. The reason I had a limited amount of time is because I also had a GI bleed. Uh, at the time of first diagnosis, uh, my hematocrit was down to maybe 40, which is moderately low. By the time of the colonoscopy, it was in the mid-30s. Oh. And so now with the steroids, they exacerbated the bleeds. This is how ignorant a, a well-financed, this guy's making big bucks in um, New London. And so anyway, within, I can't remember when I got the philosophy exactly, Put it this way, my, my hematocrit, and you know what that is? Yes. The hematocrit drops to a level of 13 when 45 is the normal. Here's the way I'd like to retell that story, is that on average, we all have nine cups of blood in us at any one time. You know, you can plus or minus, but it's about nine cups, which is a reading of about 45 degrees, or 45, sorry, not degrees, uh, hematocrit. And so to come down to 13, it means you're running on two and a half cups of blood. Oh. So that kind of huge anemia, which prog- progresses over time, not only leads into tax, uh, you know, resting uh, tachycardia, it is just amazing. It's like you just have no strength to do anything. And so I'm calling, sort of begging for a weekly CBC to see where this is, and he's uh, complaining that he thinks I'm micromanaging him. And so we parted ways. I found another doc, went and, you know, spilled myself into his office, and he does the obvious thing. It takes, you know, a new hematocrit. And sends me off for four blood transfusions in the course of four days. Oh, my goodness. And so so that what that does, by the way, is that it doesn't make you a whole person. You're on borrowed time. It's somebody else's blood. Right. And so we, you have about 90 days. Uh, from, birth to, uh, from birth to death, it's 120 days of a red blood cell. But on an average, when you're looking at plasma, it's about 90 days. So I had 90 days to say, what the heck is going on? Mm-hmm. What is going on? I mean, so it's, yeah, I understand the stress to this, but so what I first did is like, I have to heal the gut, obviously. So I had called and talked to some of my colleagues, naturopathic colleagues, mostly out West, and uh, they really didn't have anything other than, oh, uh, hey, have you heard about butyrate enemas or this probiotic or that probiotic? Right. And that was kind of that edge of thinking at that point. You had know, you, for- was the specific carbohydrate diet or the um, IBDA diet a thing back then? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, we had used they use a specific carbohydrate in uh, some of the patients, mostly autistic. It's hard to implement. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that would have been something. But it's like you can't. You know, now that I had a mind with this new blood, I go, no, I'm going to. You know, the the top gastroenterology conferences, whether they're ND or MD, and so I went down to Florida to learn about a thing called. Um, FMT, I'd read about in the New York Times, FMT is taking somebody's stool, feces, mm-hmm. however you want to look at it, and making it into an enema, and you can either have it rect- rectally up your, you know, up yourself, or uh, what they do in hospitals, they have what they call an NG tube, which is a gastric or uh, a nasal gastric tube, which they pipe it in to your small intestine, through your nose, down your esophagus, which is in the tube, and deliver it all the way down into your small intestine. And, and the goal is the small intestine. So you could say that enemas, you know, really just get it into the tail end of uh, your large intestine. Right. But, and that you hope that it all gets mixed up and eventually over time. So so from there, I got to meet some of the, and I say international, because this is still not allowed as a treatment outside of a medical practice. And these are MDs, and it's very limited. Like, just a few, certainly MDs cannot do this. Right. And, there, there is one guy out west um, that we've talked, and he's interesting. So I learned about that, but mostly I got on their email list and really started deep diving into FMT. From there, there was a, a, a another meeting at the University of Chicago, International Gastroenterology, specifically on FMT. Again, now I'm pen, pen pals with four or five of these people, and now I, my questions are, are even higher. So I go to this conference, and the NIH is there, among others, kind of to police what we're saying. Uh, there's a strong prejudice from, I'll call it Western MDs. You know, there's somebody from uh, Mass General trying to say, well, you know, just today somebody self-administered this and their life is terrible, you know, with, with details. And so, anyway, what I realized to drive it home is that 
to drive it home is that they're ideally you're looking for a donor, a clean donor that hasn't had antibiotics, eats a good diet, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's like, yeah, well, I doubt that's going to happen. Now there's even banks, by the way. Yes. Uh, you have virus. And so this is before the whole bank idea. You know, now you, you, can, you can make fun of it. You can say, ah, yes, we're, we're looking for, you know, they'll match up your, your deficiencies on a microbiome basis. It's um, life-saving. It's incredible. Yeah, it is. It is. And so there's also a business behind it. And so, um, so, so, that was, so that was that. But what I found out is that besides the donor issue, it was the frequency issue. It's not a one-off and, hey, you're going to save your life. Right. And uh, even in the hospitals, they'll say that, you know, they administer via, a, in essence, a colonoscopy, is that they'll do maybe one or two, and they'll try to really reach it around to the, the far side of the large intestine near the cecum, which is pretty good. And, but still, it's a one-off, but a better placement. So long story short, I found my donor. My donor happened to be my wife. She actually no kidding! Had- yeah, she actually hasn't had antibiotics since before she knew me. I mean, since her childhood. I knew what her diet was like, so she fits those categories. I mean, technically, if you're checking out your donors, you then go for, you know, bacterial and, you know, they're all in history. So I knew that history. So, you know, we decided to jump into it, and um, I'm sure it was much of an adventure for her as it was for me. So uh, we did it five days a week for um, four months. Yeah, you just have to keep. And where I got that tip was Dr. Uh, Tom Brody. He's from Australia. He's uh, the most experienced person doing this in the world. Uh, he has a whole institute now. Um, an amazing guy. I got to meet him twice. And uh, also out of Belgium, they're doing a lot of really interesting research. But this is now, we're talking 2012, 2012 I think we're talking. And um, it was just, you had to persist. And it's, we don't, you know, they it's used in this country for people with C. diff, which means They've had probably a terrible diet their life. They've had a lot of antibiotics their life. And so their, their gut microbiome is obviously torched. You know, it's mm-hmm. not only bad, but it's, it, there's nothing there. And so what they'll go in, it was with, they'll go in with an antibiotic and they'll wipe it out completely. So now it's just an empty tube. And then they'll do an implant. That's what they call it, an empty an implant. Mm-hmm. And that will probably help, you know, considering you're, you're reviving somebody who probably would have been dead within the next week to six weeks. Uh, yes, a profound experience in most cases. But when you, you know, make your patient that you're trying to treat, a, you know, not about to die, but in a poor state of health, like Crohn's and UC and so on, that it takes, it, there's no real data there. You say, oh, three treatments, five treatments, you know, and, and, and it was really hard to see the data. I decided to do it for myself because you realize it's not going to show up in, in JAMA anytime soon, the truth anyway. It was a really off-label, off-label. It was a non-discussed issue, but they had to talk about it because it was in the news. So you, uh, we'd go through a certain ritual. I'd stand on my head against the door afterwards and, you know, try to do all that. Eventually, it took hold. It didn't bring me back to 100%, but it brought me back to not needing any more blood transfusions. So I was at least producing my own blood. That is fantastic. So, so there, can I ask you a question? Um, when you were – so you were receiving um, donations from Judy – um, how were you, or were you doing the NG tube? Or were you doing enemas? How are you doing it? No, these are self-administered enemas. Okay. So NG okay. tube would be. Uh, I almost had the guts to do that, though, because the more of the conferences I went to, I realized the sweet spot you want to hit is in the small intestine. And yes. even if even if you're in the large intestine, you got to go, it, you have to buy the idea that eventually the bacteria, well, not just the bacteria, your microbiome and the large intestine will leak backwards up into the small intestine. Uh-huh. That, that's a working hypothesis, and so that's what you go with. But no, uh, the NG tube was not, and I don't even, and not even self-administered in the hospital, the NG tube was not without its problems. Sure. You know, not be, and not out of just discomfort. You know, you had to, if you had leakage upon withdrawal, you might even have lung infections and all these other things that were, so I thought, you know, I'll just do what I can do. So there was that. So then on to... All right, how do I get better? Now I'm just open to anything. You know, I am just not stuck with naturopathic. Um, I'm feeling better health-wise. I'm feeling a little disappointed that I couldn't pull out anything that was that I learned in my uh, education and or that I practiced that really could push me along. You know, um, I, I, to, this, to that point in this story, I hadn't been taking any supplements. And so this is a non-supplement story. So from there, I somehow discovered the 
ketogenic diet, probably because I was uh, into bone broth and how to make a more efficient bone broth. And from there, somehow there was a leap to the ketogenic diet. And uh, there clearly is not a direct line to gut health, but there's now a number of anecdotal stories, mine among hundreds of others, that it should be there. So then I went on the ketogenic diet. Judy did too, because there was more about cancer, but not necessarily meningiomas. And so we both sort of started hitting this, hitting this as we thought we knew it. And, you know, we were ketogenic by anybody's basic macro definition, macronutrient definition, but we really fine tuned it over the first couple of years. And now, you know, we're down to blood meters and ketone meters and got it all. And Really? So, wow. Uh, yeah. So, um, and now there's a group and coaching the whole nine yards, but I would say that brought me over the line completely. And, you know, it's it transformative. So uh, one was to immediately save my life, the FMT, and the other is to uh, now put me on a whole different perspective of the ketogenic diet. And, uh, you know, I have a, I'm a podcast, and but the podcast is not to sell it to anybody. As I say intermittently on the podcast, it's me learning why I didn't know about this through the 16 years that I practiced clinic, clinical medicine as a naturopathic doctor. Why was I not taught about it? I was at that year at the time that there was a movie released called First Do No, Do no Harm with Meryl Streep, which was directed by Charlie Abrams, and it was on Nightline News. This is 1994, and this is about the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. Right. We didn't hear, any, we didn't hear anything about this, you know, at that year. So, I know. So, we didn't at NCNM either. You know, I'm thinking, so I, I have to say that I, I do feel there... Our school, and I'll be more personal, so our school was agenda-driven. You know, it just didn't fit into their recipe of doing things. So now I'm thinking, Well, when we wow. were in school, what year did you graduate from Bastier, Carl? 98. 98. And I graduated from NCNM in 95. So we were approximately cohorts. When I was in school, the big thing was the vegan diet. That You know how we talk about how right. meats and poultry... Um, are bad for you because they have, you know, if they're grass, if they're not grass fed, if you, you know, if they're eating GMO corn, they're going to have a lot of, um, uh, they're, they're going to have a lot of omega-6 fatty acids in them and they're inflammatory and they have poor quality fat, um, and, you know, antibiotics and hormones. So back then the solution to all that was to not eat any at all, that you, to yeah. get rid of the whole hormone. So there wasn't right now, the popular thing to do is to find healthy animal protein, um, that's yeah. been raised grass fed. That's been raised in pristine conditions, and do eat some. But back right. then, the thing to do, you know, in those days, uh, the solution for everything was basically be a vegan. Right, right. Yeah, so that, and, and I don't know if. So, do you have any idea if best if any of the net? I, I have to ask somebody now. But are the naturopathic colleges now teaching about the ketogenic diet? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Unique, resilient potential. Three words that manifest differently within each of us. Every day we bring our unique selves out into the world and are challenged to maximize potential and stay resilient when things don't go the way we initially planned. Hi, I'm Dr. Kate Lund, licensed clinical psychologist and host of the Optimize Mind podcast. On the podcast, I engage with top thought leaders in business and personal development on how to use our uniqueness to maximize individual potential and build resilience in the face of adversity. Join us today and begin your journey to maximizing your potential. Well, if not now, they soon will be. And here's how I, here's why I say it that way is that, um, so for the last three or four years, we've been going to conferences, going to the metabolic therapy conferences and uh, low carb USA. And so I've gotten to know, pretty much all the speakers and those who are doing really good work and research and so on. And so the Low Carb USA will be in Seattle, and Joe Pizzorno has been contacted, and his daughter will be one of the speakers. That's kind of the trade-off. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, they will be hearing about it. So I'm sure that some are very much a part of it. You know, Seattle isn't <laughs> you know, East Podunk little town. is quite the opposite. And so um, I don't know if it's part of their formula, uh, formal curriculum, but I know there's a big pushback. There's, really? Uh, oh, yeah. There's a big pushback. People, when I started getting into keto and part of the naturopathic email group, which I stopped at about four or five years ago, is that, you know, it's just, you know, like, are you crazy? You know, you know look what you're doing and all these things. And it's like, you know, sorry, I, I don't have time to 
argue with you. Either you will or you won't, and you'll do your blood work, and we're going to have a good discussion. Or you, But no, there's a lot of prejudice. So it's, and it's very similar. It's like a parallel universe. to. MD Why would you be? I, I don't understand. You know what I tell my patients? The best diet for you. So if you're my patient, Carl, I say to you, you know what the best diet for you, Carl? has a very special name. It's called the yeah. Carl Diet. So it's whatever diet works for you, whatever that is. Why would you be yeah. prejudiced against a diet if it works for somebody? Why would you pre be uh, prejudiced against anything if it works for somebody? It makes no sense. I don't know. I think you're speaking to a deeper aspect. Why do people have an agenda? Why do people have a prejudice? And it usually means it's based on fear. And so what's That's that fear strange. about? You're challenging some of their you know, uh, uh, preconceptions. And if they're medical preconceptions and if they feel you're threatening to how they're practicing medicine, then that's a whole different thing. That's really all so, wrapped up. So in. what's so threatening about the ketogenic diet? Uh, you got me. I'm not the guy to stick up to that point. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that's just so interesting. I have, and you know, I have people asking me all the time about the ketogenic diet. I have some patients who do the ketogenic diet. And if they feel good on it, I support them. You know, not all of my patients want to do it. I have some patients who are thriving on it. I have, I, I have at least two who that's their jam, and they're doing great on it, and I'm absolutely going to support them. Uh, you know, I, I even tested one woman's, um, I did a blood test for her to, to see if there, were, there was acetone in her urine, you know? So, I mean, if right. people want to do it, and it makes sense for them. I mean, at this one, one of the women, well, both of them had stubborn weight loss issues. One woman is, is um, very obese, and the other woman was not obese, but she was unhappy with being stuck at a certain weight. And she went ketogenic, and it worked for her. So she didn't have as dire a situation as you had, but it's what works for her. And I have other patients who do it, and they're thrilled. And the other yeah. thing is that it's surprising to me that if they're not teaching it at the naturopathic colleges, because they're defi it's definitely in the news. I mean, you'll see it on yeah. the Today Show and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it unfortunately it's so congested now with false information. It's really hard to hear what it actually is, you know. And and and, and dialing it down, you know, everybody has their sort of reader di readers digest understanding of what this is, and often that's wrong. And so you're kind of like trying to get to the cleaner information and saying what this is. I spent a couple uh, a days up at Duke uh, Duke Hospital with Dr. Westman, who's probably the one who. Uh, he actually did uh, research in Atkins back in the 90s, and so he's probably the one who has the most experience. And his clinic is called the Obesity and Lifestyle Clinic. So people don't come to them, come to him when they're sick. They come to him when they're usually heavy. And, right. And uh, part, part of that clinic also, the far end of the other wing, is a bariatric surgery. So it's not all just him. So in that, you know, he has maybe a 40 to 50 percent compliance of all the patients that come through. And, you know, they're insurance-based and so on, so I don't think anybody pays out of pocket. So what I've learned is your success, your compliance, is really determined by the people you choose, just like research, the people you choose to work with initially. You know, how, how much are you going to call out this existing group of people to the few that are going to do very well? I'm not even, I should never even say that. Not that you know are going to do very well, because you do not know that. But those that either have the need, you've assessed that, they have the education. They have the discipline to at least follow directions. And uh, I would say just generalizing, even when I practice, you know, clinical medicine, that, you know, why didn't I get 100% compliance? Well, some people just wanted to do work by the next day, you know, had unrealistic expectations or were lazy or were undisciplined or were un uneducated, didn't appreciate what the, the deeper education was. So, there's a lot of variables, but the point was there is that I got to see how it's implemented, you know, on mass for a lot of people. And you'd have to say that this, this guy or this clinic is, you know, turned around more alive. We're talking reversing diabetes, PCOS, uh, various heart diseases, you know, um, heart transplants, so all these other things. So all these other applications to this by doing this, and he's really had to keep it bare bones, skinny, and understandable. You know, this is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do. Yeah. You know, and he, so it, it's out there. And I would say my, my position now is, yeah, I, I be candid. With me, I think everybody should be honest because it is the norm that we have. So um, it, it's very politically correct to sort of say, well, you know, whatever's ever good for you, I'm working with you. That's, that's true. And that's a good place in the, in the spectrum to begin. But if we're talking about health in the last 
Oh, since the late 50s to really up to, to this decade, this whole idea of low fat, you know, it's now being turned around and there's good research and good doctors and good everything turning that around in many countries, you know, South Africa, Tim Noakes and the UK and Europe and so on. So it's no one's life, North of Scandinavia. But when we had, was that 60 years, 60 years of blood work in which the norm diet was pretty much considered now a high carbohydrate diet, even though we didn't call it that then. And the norm glucose levels were probably, we, we considered 90s were okay. We, yeah, we say lower is better. But nobody, you know, that, that throws off a lot of hormonal issues. So what we're finding now when people drop to their, let's say, 20 carbs a day and hold it and get all these other changes is that some people get, quote, unquote, hypothyroid. Uh, so then you go, but yet they don't have the symptoms. So it's unlike, mm-hmm. you know, subclinical hypothyroid. It's, it's clinical, but there's no symptoms. And should you worry about it? Should you not worry about it? Yeah, what well, I see I, when my patients drop their carbs really low, often what I'll see is a normal TSH and normal T4, and I'll see low um, total T3 and low to low normal T3 T3. Stay with us. We'll be right back. If you have been struggling to change your drinking habits, I know how frustrating it can be, especially when your best attempts have you thinking about alcohol even more. That's because counting days and avoiding alcohol actually makes it harder. My name is Mary Wagstaff, and I am here to help you make lasting change this year. As an expert certified holistic alcohol coach and host of the podcast, Stop Drinking and Start Living, I offer an evolutionary proven process to help you get alcohol out of your way and keep it there that fits seamlessly into your lifestyle. If you're ready for a new perspective on an old habit, subscribe to Stop Drinking and Start Living on your favorite podcast platform. And, and right, so, but, so you have to ask the question. See, here's the question is, what, what is normal in the sense of, we right. just came through seven years of really uh, incorrect lab data because it was all taken in a whole different milieu. Of, That's of very blood, interesting. You know? You know, One of my patients only- who eats ketogenically, um, I do his blood work and it comes back with the low T3 and I say to it, so when people come in and they have a low T3, I say to them, how do you feel? And if they feel great, I don't do anything about it. And this guy, I said, you know, your T3 is low. He said, I know it's because I'm eating really low carb. I don't want to do anything about it. I'm like, okay. So right. he doesn't right. feel symptomatic be- because of it, just like you said. Right. So, but you still have to ask the question, why is that reading that way? Well, right. what happened? Is that maybe that is actually the norm? If you go on the, you know, go back a hundred years and, uh, and, and pretend we had these lab tests and go back, it's like that was probably the norm in a low carb normal diet, which was presumptively how we ate back, you know, a uh, hundred to two hundred years ago, mm-hmm. in the very least before the 1977 dietary regulations were changed in the United States. So there's that. So that means that I expect other labs to be equally off. You know, the hormonal labs in particular to be equally off, to be lower in this new context. And so I haven't seen that yet, but that would be my expectation. You know, pick your pick your hormones, so to say. And um, the whole issue of uh, cholesterol is now being thrown out the window as being irrelevant to really anything, uh, yeah. Other than get your trigs down and your HDL up, so which you can easily do that in a, <laughs> a ketogenic diet, and you know, get your essential fat. And but you know, it's. It, the questions that are asked are, there is no such thing as an essential carb. You do not need to eat carbs. People go, well, wait a minute. You just threw the... Well, when you in. say a carb, define a carb. Carbohydrate. I mean, what's what's an example of a food that is a carbohydrate that you don't need to eat? What, that things that people think of that they need to eat all the time that have carbs okay, that you're saying so, you don't have to eat those. Okay, so I just said something pretty extremely radical. Yeah, I'm go for it. There, there's no evidence you need to eat any veggies any grains, any oh. potatoes, any tubers, any of that. There, there's no evidence of that. There's no kidding. No that is radical. In fact, and in fact, this sends you down a whole different, really interesting road to examine. It's like, and we didn't get this straight up, at, let's say, at fast beer. I don't have a chip in my shoulder at fast beer, but that's not what's cool. Um, that, you know, there are a lot of what they call anti-nutrients in full well, grains, for, we know that. Yes. In, in, in both, and basically most, Carbohydrates, we'll say, in general. So the veggies and everything else. So you have the oxalates, you have the phytates, you know, all these other things. So, for instance, we have been 
uh, you know we had a big garden where we lived in this thing. But we, we, I've not gardened probably in a, a year and a half. Uh, didn't really have a space in Cape Cod. But we did it upon ourselves to be uh, carb-less. That is what they call zero-carb or uh, you know, carnivore, they call it now, uh, which basically means you're not eating any veggies and, of course, no grains and tubers and so on. And what's the first thing I noticed is, like, I never thought I had complaints, you know, post the obvious story. And suddenly I you feel leaner. You know, there's a lot less. So these anti-nutrients are something, and they are a struggle for our body to, to take in. And they do sort of compete with these nutrients. So when we, when we look at this salad or we look, go online and say, you know, what's in an almond? What's in a beet? What's in a um, arugula? It's like, well, yeah, those nutrients are in that, but do you get that? You have to digest that. So, yeah, it's dependent on your digestive tract. Let's put that variable off to the side. But it's dependent on the anti-nutrients in that thing that will keep those nutrients from ever getting into your blood. So it's a real interesting um, awareness that uh, technically I knew of. It was no, nothing, any, it's never anything I really was going to look into. And now I realize it's actually pretty awesome. So, um, so you're saying that it, you're you're um, basically down to a, a zero level carb. So I, I have so many questions. So I want I want to back up a second. Um, my for for my uh, listeners, what does FMT stand for? Fecal microbiota transfer. Right. It's also called FT. Uh, uh-huh. FT is fecal sure. transfer. Okay. And why is it better to do FMT than to take probiotics? Uh, Probiotics are like a rent cost in the sense that uh, there is no evidence that whatever probiotics, and I'm saying there is reason to take probiotics, by the way, mm-hmm. um, but pro- probiotics will last as long as you are taking them. They don't regenerate. Yes. They don't give a second generation in your gut. They, they are kind of going through and they're, they're becoming the, uh, the lactose or whatever, and they're going through and they're being that guy or woman um, while, until they get pooped out on the other side. Right. And so they will mitigate a potentially worse situation from happening. But they will not give you, they will not correct your microbiome. Okay. So, and your microbiome is, in essence, the fingerprint from the food you eat. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, when people go, I need a healthy microbiome, for one, that's a stupid thing to say. You mm-hmm. need to be healthy, and you need to get the biome that's appro- microbiome that's appropriate for you. And, and there's a, and then now that now there, it's called enterotype. Entero is another uh, word for the small intestine. So enterotype. Now, because they, they, they initially, having been part of those conferences early on, they initially said, well, a healthy microbiome is the one that has the most diverse, you know, and they measured just bacterial species, the most diverse different bacterial species and gena and families and so on and so forth. Well, now they find that, gosh, those who are vegetarians have one kind of microbiome. Those who are uh, like zero-carb people, like myself now, have another uh, self-induced different microbiome. Of those course. Who are, you know, and so now we go, well, duh. You know, <laughs> otherwise, we would have been telling people we all need to eat the same diet. If we're going off, we all need to achieve the same microbiome. So now we find out microbiomes in Eskimos back in the day was, was healthy for them, given, or it was, first of all, induced by their diet, and it was healthy for them. And so when you now start looking at this, a selection, many selections, and it's ongoing and very hard to study, frankly, the whole me- metabolomics sort of thing, as much as it's being talked about left, right, and center, and this is what you need to do. It's, there's still a lot of unknown information about that. And so there's a big variety that's necessary. So now we come to the point of, I, in the back of my mind, I was always wondering, it's like, wow, you're going to have a pretty extreme, extremely one-sided kind of microbiome. And I'm going, I've never felt healthier. Yeah. So, Well, that's the proof. I mean, that you're extremely healthy. You had like a really, really bad case of inflammatory bowel disease. You no longer do. And you're fitter than you were in your 30s. So, I mean. I would say at least, yeah, back in the days I was doing triathlon. Ah. I know. So it's like, you know, I I go, so if I was so smart, so I say to myself, Mr. Smarty Pants, you know, if, if you were so smart, how did you miss this big, obvious thing that, for the most part, Atkins was correct? Right. Um, right. Atkins, he was the first one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was. And actually, well, he wasn't the first one. In the 50s, he went to a guy. So when, so what I did when I, I got so into this, I go, I have to go back to zero. I have to go back to who, where did this idea came up, come uh-huh. from? So in 1921, a guy named William Wilder, the Mayo Clinic, 
And that was back when Dr. Mayo actually lived. And so there was a guy named Dr. Mayo who uh, in Rochester, uh, Minnesota. And so at the Mayo Clinic, William Wilder, and 1921 is just after World War I. And it's just after the hellacious pandemic of the Spanish flu. And it's like, if more people had died in the previous five years worldwide than it's ever happened in the world since, I don't think, the plague. It, it, so anyway, this is when you put it in that context, you know, um, it's huge. And so they were trying to, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, fasting was very popular. And they actually would put uh, type 1 diabetics on a complete fast for three weeks and then a partial fast. But and instead of dying like type 1 diabetics do, they would last for five years and die a miserable death by partial starvation. But there was data there. And for epileptics, those who were fasted for three weeks, we're talking a water fast only, you know, you have, uh, hot water, cold water, or no water. That's the menu. For three weeks, that at least 50% their epilepsy never came back. Well, well, now we're so smart today. We know there's different types of epilepsy and so on and so forth. So we didn't know that then. But clearly it was effective when nothing else was effective. And by the way, there's even cases in the Bible and before the Bible, Hippocrates treating epilepsy with fasting. So wow. Clearly, you know, we're, we're not very smart, even up to 1921, by thinking, gosh, we discovered, you know, fasting for epilepsy. But somehow you got to get food back into their diet. So the idea was, if you could make a diet that had as many ke- as was as ketogenic, was as capable of producing ketones as a fasting person was, and therefore we don't have to starve them to death, but we can now give them food, but maintain, because it was all believed, and still is believed, um, that it is the ketones and then the subsequent biochemical reactions to all these different things because of acetoacetate, yes, and beta-hydroxybutyrate, and even acetone. And these three ketone bodies are responsible for driving the difference. And so that's where the ketogenic diet got started. It got brought down to the classic ketogenic diet by 1924 by a guy named Dr. Peterman, which is 20 carbs per day. And they were doing, uh, I believe it was one gram per kilogram body weight protein. It certainly can exceed that. But that's where they mapped it out. So that did not change all the way up until the time of Atkins. Atkins attended a talk. Um, it, it went out of, uh, by the way, so the ketogenic diet went out of favor due to the anti-seizure medications that came on. And no it was kidding. Forgotten. Yeah, it was forgotten. And the only place in the country that was practiced still was at Johns Hopkins. Because back in the early story, pre 1921, there happened to be a, a case in which uh, an endocrinologist, son-in-law, whatever, by marriage, who was a wealthy attorney, was supposed to help the child with epilepsy. He had nothing he could do, but he said, well, let's go out to Battle Creek, Michigan, where it's this guy named, I can't remember all the names out there, but let's go out there. I hear that fasting is helping epilepsy. So he takes them there, and he, he has no experience as endocrinologist, and takes them there, and they stay for the three weeks while their son and daughter, and I can't remember the details now, goes through the three weeks fasting, and it totally cures his epilepsy. So because that happened, this wealthy, the father of this particular son or daughter, a wealthy New York attorney, said, you need to find out, and I was talking to Andrew Collins, I will pay you, I will set up a foundation to find out why this is working. So that foundation is set up, and actually that is set up at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And it was enough money to keep it going in perpetuity. So that little place is now trying to find out, you know, why it's working. And there's no better answers other than it does work. But they become the, the, the de facto place outside of Mayo, which is where the ketogenic diet got started. So it gets forgotten all every, everywhere in the world for the most part. And uh, it's not even done at Mayo very much, but it is done at Johns Hopkins for pediatric epilepsy. And so when... Charlie Abrams, who's the uh, director of Police Academy and Airplane 1 and 2. You probably remember those back in the day. Yeah. His son was born and had severe epilepsy. Uh, it was brought around. It, they did all the anesthesia medications that they helped. He even went and did some brain surgery. I don't know what the brain surgery was, and that didn't help. And then he happened to be, this is a guy who like, does his own research, um, happened to discover this little a booklet from Johns Hopkins on the ketogenic diet for pediatric epilepsy. It was a bit dated. And he looked at it, and he calls them and said, are you guys still open? I mean, is this what you do? I, you know, we're at the, or with them. And so they fly over there. They get started with a diet. It has an amazing change. And so Jim Abrams is so 
there's his son is Charlie, by the way. Jim Avon is so influ- influential. He's both bitter and he's very ambitious. He then, you know, asks his friend, his actor's friend, Meryl Streep, among others, will you be in this movie called First Do No Harm, which is about the application of the ketogenic diet for epilepsy before drugs and before surgery. I am going to go home and watch that if I can find it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I've heard and it's so, good. Yeah. Yep. Not only that, he connects, he starts, this is before the movie's, I think before the movie's released, he picks out about seven hospitals and he tells them about it and gets them training. He said, I'm going to do a media event and you're going to have your phones ringing off the wall. So the movie comes out. He's scheduled with Ted Koppel on Nightline. He does a nightline with with the doctor they had originally for Charlie, the son, who had the epilepsy. And Ted Koppel asks the doctor, you know, so why didn't you prescribe the ketogenic diet? And the doctor said, well, uh, it seemed too complicated. He didn't even present it as an option and just presumed it was too complicated. It really probably was code for he didn't know what he was talking about. People who are motivated so, will do it, though. That, so, that's what you see. And, and, and let's look, look at this. Is it, is it taught in medical school? Well, that's what we're saying, that it wasn't taught to us at NCNM and mm-hmm. Bastier. Right. So it's probably not taught in medical school either. So how would he know unless he did the research on his own? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stress and trauma happen inside of our bodies, so we can't just heal them through talking. We must also heal them through feeling. My name is Luis Mojica, I'm a somatic educator and nutritionist, and I'm also the host of the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where every week I teach you how to release stress and trauma and find a safety inside of yourself through nutrition, self-inquiry, and somatic experiencing. Join me over at the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast or visit me at holisticlifenavigation.com. Right. Well, it it was it was once up. It was up into it was in neurology textbooks up through the '60s, if I can recall. And so it was one of these things. It was just skip. You know, I'll just skip that part. Yeah, it's an old. It's a relic. (laughs) The first thing, the first time I heard about the ketogenic diet was after NCNM, which is now NUNM. And I was in Newfoundland. I was in the first place I practiced, and a family came in with a child who had seizure disorder. And she was on the ketogenic diet. And when and I had never heard of it before. And they had her on a ton of dairy fat, and that's how they were getting her ketones down. So she was eating a lot of whipping cream right. and heavy cream and stuff like that. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So let me ask you some, some practical questions. Um, first of all, um, now, I, what's an average day in the ketogenic diet for you and Judy? Okay, specifically? Yeah. Um, what do you eat? We eat, we eat pretty much... Um, Nothing for breakfast. Sometime between 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock, we'll have kind of a snack. You know, she'll have, she has her thing, and I'll have my thing. What's my thing? My thing is I can reach in and get bacon. We make our own mayo. It, we, one of the things, we do have a product that I've long since been looking for. It took a long time to come out with it. It's a, a caprylic acid triglyceride. So it's a C8 triglyceride product. Uh, why did I get into that? Well, it's because I went to one of the metabolic therapy conferences and talked to a doctor up in Canada and who is working specifically with essential fatty acids. I know this is a <laughs> loop. <laughs> you can never answer a straight question. And so C8 is a eight carbon fat. I call it a monofilament fat. It's a straight line. Saturated fat is a straight line. It's all, you know all that. And so it's about as simple as fat as you can get. And when you take this fat, and you shouldn't just drink it down like, fat. You should put it in your food and do like you do with olive oil. You put it on things and in things and so on and so forth. But it has the ability to go from your small intestine directly into your liver. Your liver then turns around and makes it into ketones, ketoacetate, and then quickly into BHB. And so you can be in ketosis or making ketones within 15 minutes that's documented, well, certainly documented by us. But this is what I had learned. And so I started uh, talking to uh, Dr. Stephen Kinney, who was up at uh, Sherbrooke University, to kind of get the, the whole story on that. So I'll be interviewing him, actually, next week. Excellent. Um, and so, you know, really got into that. Now it's used for Alzheimer's and, you know, how is C8 different than C10? When pe- people talk about MCT oil, MCT oil is C8 and C10. That's good. C8 is better. 
and DOL is given an MCC and all that stuff. So, but anyway, C8 is kind of the, the coup de gras of essential fatty acids and your body's own ability to make beta hydroxybutyrate quickly. And that wow. we haven't got into the brain thing, but what they find is your brain uses ketones preferred over glucose. No and, kidding. Yeah, no, and that's uh, been in the last ooh, five years. And so it's so it's turning Parkinson's, uh, MS, certainly Alzheimer's on its head in terms of wow. they don't have to be old and demented. Certainly the time of intervention counts. So anyway, so back to what I do, it is just something that, so now we bottle it and we sell it on Amazon. We then learned about sustainable harvesting and a whole nother show on what that means, sustainable harvested palm oil and with the effects of very detrimental effects environmentally of not sustainably harvested palm oil is right. going to the world. So. Um, that took a lot to find where do you get this stuff, you know, and all this other stuff. Anyway, so that's always on the kitchen counter. So sometimes when I have coffee, I'll do a little squirt of that in my coffee. So you do have sometimes coffee. I'll... I was going to ask you that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do have coffee. Start the day off with coffee, but not with, so I don't, I don't do a squirt of C8 in my coffee until maybe around noon. Sometimes I'll add a little a collagen in there. It's, it's kind of my, uh, faux creamer, collagen and C8 with a little stevia. Mm-hmm. And uh, so in terms of what to eat, I'll, I'll scoop out some mayo, put it on some bacon. We have a stash of hard-boiled eggs. I put some mayo on some hard-boiled eggs, and it's my uh, very quick deviled eggs, so to say. And, and that's my unprepared snack. And so for dinner, we basically have five out of seven nights a week. We basically put a steak on the grill, and I go out and grill it and bring it back in. So on that steak, I'll put some mayo on the side, and I'll put some C8 uh, on top of it. And uh, that's pretty much the the uh, the food part. So, uh, do you eat other um, do you eat other animal protein besides beef? Yeah, yeah. And we have a lot of big stash of uh, Alaskan caught uh, salmon, so we have a freezer for that. We go through. We have our chicken. Uh, certainly have pork. And so um, it's more about what you can get when you can get. It. Now we're in in New Bern, which there's there's no Whole Foods and so on and so forth. So you have to do a lot of really picking around the different grocery stores to find out what meat you can get but and you don't eat any vegetables or any fruit at all no i haven't for a while and uh but let me tell you we must have a couple hundred jars of things we put away of various relishes and so on and so forth so we don't hesitate to pull that out uh but it's certainly maybe once a week if that we pull it out right. just it, first of all it started out as an experiment of a year ago something i'd heard at a conference and well over a year ago now and now it's like wow Life survives. Life is good. You know, I've had blood work done, and I, I don't. We're good. It might, you know, the thing about the uh, the uh, ketogenic diet, it will drop your CRP like a stone. You know, people that's who great. Have, that's, Cardiac that's C-reactive good. protein. Your okay. um or your gonna, C-reactive protein. It's, ask. A, yeah. it's an right. inflammatory marker. Okay. Right, right. But drop it like a stone. You will be under one. And so fabulous. Uh, yeah, so you're so this is really really fascinating, and I don't have a, we don't have a lot of time yet because you're so brilliant. And you talked about so many fascinating things, <laughs> but the hour's almost up. So the last thing I want you to talk about is tell us about you and exercise. What's the exercise you're able to do, and what's the best exercise when you're ketogenic, or is it you know specific to you? Because I know you're doing some stuff. So tell us about that. Yeah, I don't know how you knew that, but that's true. It's on uh, the website. <laughs> You can hide, it, and you can run, but you can't that's hide. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, we do no ads, and so that's why I'm always amazed. How'd you, that's why I asked. How'd you find out about us? We don't do any ads. So. Anyway, um, <laughs> so really it comes down to uh, high HIT, high-intensity training, slow movement. It's a slow movement. And so it's really a series of exercises, and they're, you, know, you can do them at the gym on various machines. They, they are, uh, I don't think any of them are free weights. You also can do them in bands at home. And, you know, they're squats, deadlifts, chest flies, um, back rows. You know, and these are, this is common terminology that people do. You know, these are your, your you know, uh, quads. And so you do your, your leg presses. You do your hams, which is the opposite. You're flexing your legs. And so you do this. High-intensity exercise means you will be done with your exercise in 40 to 90 seconds. And so we're not spending a lot of time at the gym. You do a whole set. This whole thing that I just sort of mentioned briefly will take you 14 minutes maximum, probably a little bit less. What it comes down to is reaching threshold. Threshold is getting to the point of 
fight or flight, you know, you're now invoking adrenaline. And what happens then? Well, you're activating a lot of other hormones. Your HGH goes up. Human growth hormone. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and so you get, you can go on and on. You know, I mean, how it sensitizes insulin and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's, it's such a good tandem uh, approach to efficient for one. You do that twice a week because you need 48 to 60 hours to recuperate once you reach threshold. If you're doing it and you don't reach threshold, and people say, I had a high intensity exercise session for 90 minutes or 40 minutes. No, you didn't. <laughs> you know, I, you didn't. I, I it, sense another it, show coming on here. Yeah. And I think we could, we could do a, a day in the life of, of you, Carl. Okay. And we'll just, yeah. we'll just walk through the whole thing. We'll do a whole show on it. And we'll break it down as to no, because you know you're 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 walking the walk, you're talking the talk, and I I would love to have a show that was um, pretty much you know just just letting people know how to do it, and you know really like a beginner's entry point to how to do this. I think it would be a, yeah. just a brilliant show. I think it'd be really cool. Didn't mean yeah. to interrupt, yeah. but I had to mention that. No. Also, but because we have to wrap up. Um, right, right. So, <laughs> Carl, <there's> <laughs> are you doing? Um, so, you're down in Newborn, uh, New Bern, North Carolina. Um, do you are you doing consults now? <laughs> I, yeah, it's a good way. That's what we call them consults. We have uh, group coaching, so we you know we have a program for that. Um, I'm working on what I call an ideal program. It will be mostly automated, and then once a week, sort of one on one with me for a cute kind of office appointment. We'll call it. Very and, good. Uh, I, I like that because. It really uh, provides portability. You know, you can live anywhere. And um, so we're, we, we have weekly Zoom meetings, you know, for that particular group. Uh, some people ask for one-on-one, which I kind of try to stay out of for the most part because it's, uh, it really locks you down to being one-on-one. I like That's to right. uh, you know, learn, learn to leverage. A better business plan is leverage, um, scaling it a little bit. So, uh, How do people get in touch with you if they want to work with you? Uh, one or two ways. People can... Um, so Keto Naturopath is both, it's, I once thought I was going to do a blog, but now I use that blog simply for me to post my podcast. And uh, then we have a, a Facebook group called Keto Naturopath. And um, they can, so my email is for that is drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. But just, you know, if you Google Keto Naturopath, you'll get one of two places. Um, right. The Facebook group, we, we make people uh, answer three questions to come in. So it's not for everybody. We, there's no advertising and all this other stuff. And uh, it was initially it was primarily for doctors. Now it's been the patients of and now the friends of. So it's, it is a small group of 700, but um, mm-hmm. it's active real. And I'd rather have that than the alternative. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so your website is ketonaturopath.com. Um, and um, your, what did you say, drcoldcamp at gmail.com? Yeah, it's, yes, exactly. Okay, VR. very good. So that's how people can get a hold of you. So I have to wrap up. This was yep. awesome. And it's true. Maybe we'll maybe we'll bring you back in, in um, a couple of months and have you, you know, do a day in the life. I, I have yep. patients who are going to be fascinated with this. It's very, you know, I have a lot of patients who are interested in keto. I have several patients who are doing the ketogenic diet. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are interested in it. And it's as much as they're not necessarily teaching it in schools, it is trendy. So people, I mean, it's certainly one of the accepted ways um, to improve your health that's in the popular media now. So um, right. so that's very yep. interesting. So um, it's been really wonderful um, talking with you again. And I'm so thrilled that I'm, I, I mean, my heart goes out to you for all that you've been through and that you were able, that, that you fought so hard to come back from it and you, you left no stone unturned in terms of looking for what was going to help you. And you found something that not, not only worked for you, but it's making you thrive in a way that you never thrived before. It's incredible. I'll go with that. It's, yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate your time. You bet. So you this take care, great, Carl. Carl. Yes. Um, hopefully we'll talk to you again before too long, and um, I'll be getting this podcast up before too long. So if you didn't get to listen to this whole show, this will be up in podcast pr- probably within the week. So you take care, Carl. I will talk to you again soon. Thank you so much for calling and being a part of Radio Naturopath. Okay. Take care. Bye. All right. Take you care, too. Carl. All right. That was a that was. A-
amazing, that wasn't was it? That was great. I was know, great. right? Wow. What, what a wealth of knowledge there. So we encourage you to go to Keto Naturopath and, and listen to Carl's other podcasts because um, he does a podcast about this. And if you want to reach out to him and work with him, you can go to Keto Naturopath and contact him that way. So you've been listening to Radio Naturopath, which is the call and talk show about health and natural medicine. I am Fran Storch, ND, naturopathic physician with my co-host, Ron Manizza. You can email me with questions and comments at radionaturopath at gmail.com. If you'd like to listen to this show at another time, you can check out our podcast at whus.org. You can also leave questions or comments at my Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram at Fran Storch, ND. Thank you for listening to Radio Naturopath, your show where you can learn about the best of science and nature. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I thought I would take a moment of your time to tell you about something that we've been working on for a long time, and that is our product of C8 Keto MCT oil. How is it different and why would you even care about it? It's the highest purity you can find in the market, which is 99.7% caprylic acid triglyceride. And by the way, that's backed up by a certificate of analysis. It's not just me making up these numbers. But I think the bigger story behind our C8 MCT oil is not only that it is the most efficient way for you to create ketones naturally, and that is all three ketones, your beta-hydroxybutyrate, your acetoacetate, and your acetone. That's important. But the other part is it supports sustainably harvested palm oil. Why would you care? Because all the other C8 oil products out there, not the MCT oils, but the C8 MCT oils, some people call them ketogenic oils out there. They come from palm oil. And palm farming, specifically palm kernel farming in Southeast Asia, is decimating the rainforest there. Absolutely. You go on right now to Google or to YouTube and say palm oil Southeast Asia, and you will be in tears at the end of 10 minutes when you see the destruction that's happening. This is not part of that. This is the exception. So it's called RSPO, Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. You have to apply for it. You have to be audited by them. And it's a long, rigorous process. And it took us two years to bring this product to market. I hope you care. And I know you'll care about the efficiency in which it helps you make ketones. By the way, we don't drink this like it's a fluid. We put a little bit in our coffee. We make our mayonnaise out of it. We make uh, various salad dressings out of it when we have a salad. It's basically a, I hate to say crutch, but it's my aid to keeping me in ketosis when I want to be in ketosis. It's fast. It's long lasting, certainly long, longer lasting than exogenous ketones and much more holistic, as I mentioned, with all three ketones. That's about as much as I want to say. I hope you look into it. I hope you uh, take your ketones readings on a regular basis as long with your glucose. If you do, then you really value this product. All the best. And I thought you should know.